Leadership is the ability to disappoint people at a rate they can absorb. And you have to be able to use your power to do that. And compassionately and empathically, but clearly. Why did I become an executive coach? I saw lots of great people fail to get ahead at work, while their much less talented peers blew right past them. That made me furious, but also curious. What were great people getting wrong? It came down to helping them re-examine what drove success and then helping them make critical shifts one hard truth at a time. Feel like you're doing everything you were told, but you're not moving ahead at work nor having the impact you seek? Then welcome to 97% Effective with Michael Winderoth, where we skip feel-good, happy talk and engage experts in pointed conversations about what it really takes to move the needle at work and your career. So if you feel stalled or frustrated or seek that extra edge as you move to the next level, then look no further. This is the Hard Truths Playbook you never got. Hi, I'm Michael Wenderoth, and you're listening to 97% Effective. Congratulations, you've been promoted. But you missed the big warning sign. There's a massive waterfall ahead. The hard truth is that the demands, spotlight, and complexities of your job on you will increase exponentially and in ways you can't even imagine. The hard truth in numbers, a shocking 60% of new executives fail within their first 18 months. And according to today's guest, whose exceptional research became the basis of his number one bestseller, Rising to Power, 69% of those new executives said they were not prepared. 76% said the training and preparation they received was only minimally helpful. And only 45% had a moderate understanding of the complexities they would face. Which begs the question, what are new executives or their organizations or the ones that train them missing? More importantly, what distinguishes the exceptionally successful and what can we learn and apply from that? My guest today, Ron Carucci, managing partner and co-founder of Navalent, brings a 30-year track record helping CEOs and executives tackle the toughest leadership challenges. And his team mined exceptional data from their work over the years to uncover four areas that senior executives must master to successfully lead as they rise to the top. I will go as far as saying, don't even think about taking or starting a job at the top without having read this book. Ron is the author of eight books, a regular, quite prolific contributor to Harvard Business Review, and a highly sought after speaker. And on a personal note, I want to thank Ron for shaping the way I think about power and influence and for being so generous with his time. Ron, a huge honor to discuss with you your book, Rising to Power, The Journey of Exceptional Executives. Welcome to 97% Effective. Hey, Michael, how are you? So great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Let's start on a personal note. You said in an interview way back that back during your corporate career, before you founded Navalent, that you yourself were successful, but maybe not as successful as you could have been as an executive on the inside rising. If if you could go back and coach Ron at the time of his ascent, how would you have helped Ron identify what he was missing and help him most succeed? Oh, gosh. Well, I, you know, as I knew you would be the one to only ask me questions that no one's ever asked me, that's a great question. Because my intro, it's, you know, it's not, it's not unknown that my inside career of organizations was not, those were not my best years. You know, I, I was politically so unsavvy. I mean, so here's what I would do. I would have said, write Michael and ask him to have written his book on power 20 years earlier so I could have read it and been aware of the dynamics that I, it wasn't that I wasn't aware of them, Michael, I, I willfully ignored them. I thought I was, I was exempt from them. I thought I was, I've been hired to tell the truth. I've been hired in my role as a, an org psychologist inside companies doing OD work to make things better. And by, by definition, that meant I had to talk about the things that weren't going well. Now, on top of that, you should probably do those things skillfully and with a little bit of savvy and a little bit of diplomacy, also skills that I had not yet formed. 
And so I'm sure what it came across as was, was a little bit reckless. I, what it actually was was incredibly naive. I just didn't understand what I was tampering with. And so, you know, I, I, had, I began to build this wonderful collection of severance packages that eventually I got the hint that, you know, and so in between my corporate gigs, I go out and consult. And I began to quickly see that the same behavior that got me paid a lot of money outside is what got me in trouble inside. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to live out my passion for organizations, which I really do have a passion for, it's going to have to be by not being part of one. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, ancient wisdom says you can't be a prophet in your own land. And I think I was just living proof of that. Mm. Well, we're glad that you made the shift. Your books, and particularly Rising to Power, which we're going to talk about, uh, has been really useful for me as I help executives on, on their ascent. So it's had this uh, multiplying impact and, and for you to be able to see a lot of these things and to be able to kind of humbly look back at yourself, I, I think says a lot about you and, and what you do. Let's dive in. And a, and a quick question, because we talk about exceptional executives and success, just the definition of success that we're using here um, and that you, that you used kind of in your research, um, was this like a performance or organizational metric, success in the view of peers or others? And I, and I ask this question because success obviously can have many definitions, and we see a lot of top executives today do really well for themselves, right. but do terrible for their organizations. So it's, it's, the, it's the former, for sure. It's, it's, first of all, did you get to keep the job? And did you, have a, did you have impact? In other words, did you remit in the role that you were given, what the role was required to remit. Mm. So it's a, it's a very baseline definition. It has something to do with, you know, your grand slam home runs, you're knocked out of the park. Certainly that has something to do with personal success. Okay. It's, did you deliver for the organization what you were, what you were given the job to deliver? Okay. So fulfilling your mandate as, de as defined by the organization. Okay. And I, I want to start... <sighs> I touched on this. We, we see lots of narcissistic leaders out there who are destroying value countries, organizations. And, and that gets a lot of our attention and frankly gives power, <laughs> the title of your book, uh, that is a central part in mine, a, a really bad name. And one thing that really jumped out to me in, in your research and your book is that you found that most executives failed not from abusing power, this is where our, most of our minds go, but from abdicating their power. I, I have found, since I've read that, a, a, an incredibly profound statement, one that just really stuck with me and, and sticks with the executives that I talk about. Can you say more about this point? Yeah, it was certainly the biggest shock, to, to one of the biggest shocks to me in the research. Um, and then uh, suddenly I, I screened my career of clients and realized, oh my gosh, that's where they all struggled. In, in many ways, they, you know, because they didn't have the benefit of your book, they were trying to overcompensate, right? So I, I don't want to be perceived as the guy Michael Wunderworth writes about. But so to avoid that, I'm going to run the other way to such an extreme. Um, and, you know, I think you and I both, I think both of our research certainly crosses the path on a number of different elements of power, none the least of which is we don't teach people how to use it. We don't do a good job of people teaching people that it's, it's an asset to be stewarded and you have to learn to steward it, preferably long before you actually have it. Uh, so leaders in their um, desire to be popular, to be liked, to not disrupt, you know, or make people uncomfortable, to almost be Santa Claus, distribute yeses, affirmations, you know, it's the benevolent dictator thing. At the peril and the performance of their organizations, they don't realize they're deluding and confusing people with that lack of, you know, your power is meant to be used for a greater good. And you have to appreciate that leadership is the ability to disappoint people at a rate they can absorb. And you have to be able to use your power to do that. And compassionately and empathically, but clearly. And narrowing people's focus by saying no, for example, one of the things that leaders who abdicated the power struggled with is actually one of the greatest gifts you can give them because now you've clarified the, the lit path towards success. But if you, if the aperture is so wide, 
and, and the priorities are changing by the day and you know, you, so suddenly there's a crisis du jour, all you do in your, you know, your self-perceived benevolence is dilute their, you know, dilute their efforts and make them feel meaningless. And, and it just begs the question to me, I mean, <laughs> companies and leaders have been around and, and management studies and leadership studies have been around. It's like, what has the in industry been getting wrong? Like, why, why does this continue to persist? Well, I, th I mean, <laughs> you, I hope one day you'll have Barbara Kellerman on your show. You know, her book, The End of Leadership, I just thought was a fabulous look at the answer to that question. You know, leadership's an industry. It's not, you know, we've, we've, lost, capa we've lost sight of the fact that it's actually a capacity you have to create. Mm. And we do need leaders. But we, for all of the billions and billions of dollars we spend investing and cultivating them, we're clearly falling way short. I think there's lots of reasons for that. Not the least of which is we're getting, people are getting to these roles now much earlier. Yeah. I just literally spent the last few days with a, a, a CEO of a very large company in, in the United States. And uh, it was a very quick, they were having sort of a, a sudden need for our intervention. So it was a very quick, from the time we first met to the time I was with his team this week, it was like four weeks. And when I first met him on, uh, it was by video call, and his CHRO was the one who was brokering the meeting, so she was there. And then he came on the screen, and I literally, I mean, I'm sure if, if it was videoed, I would look like this. And my first question was, wait, where's your dad? <laughs> like, he, he looked like he was 23. He, he, uh, turns out he just looks really good for his age. But they're just getting younger and younger and younger into these roles these days with less and less preparation. And uh, I think we don't uh, appreciate the depth of what it takes to prepare these leaders. So we, you know, we send them off to Harvard for a week or we hire them a coach. And of course, today, coaches have proliferated like a bad rash. And so, you know, with very little training, um, you can go to Costco and get a certification now to be a coach. And so with no clinical, no basic clinical skills to know that they're seeing pathologies right in front of them like narcissism, the one you talk about in your book, and what to do about it. And so we're teaching them to be confident and better, you know, here's some listening skills techniques and barely scratching the surface of what it really takes to cultivate true executive level leadership. And it's sad because I think one of the, I mean, the, the rise into power was born out of, out of a very personal tragedy for us. We, we had been working with a CEO, it was our second major enterprise with him. He took us with him when he went to run another big company. And in the middle of a transformation, new new design comes to light. And we put people in the new design. And one, one of the younger leaders, clearly on every hypo list in the company, um, was given a much bigger job. No surprise to anybody. And as we sort of passed the baton off, we'd done all of our help to, to start the new enterprise up. And off we went. About nine months later, I saw his name in my caller ID, and I thought, oh, it's David. He's calling to see, check in and see how things are going. And I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating all these wonderful stories, how the new design is playing out and the impact he's having and blah, blah, blah. He was calling to tell me he'd been fired and that he needed help networking. And I could barely catch my breath. Within an hour and a half, the CEO called to say they had let him go. And more than subtly, implying that part of the failure was mine for not having better prepared him. And I thought, that's the call no consultant wants. And so I asked him, I said, Could I, I don't, I mean, we all have off days. I have never so wildly misjudged someone's potential and talent this way. Could I just come in and sniff around? Could I just come in and look and, uh, on my own time and dime? Just because we can, we can both learn. And so he said, sure. So I went, we went around and sniffed around and tried to retrace the nine months to see where, where could this have gone sideways? And that was the investigation that led to our 10-year study for Rising to Power, because what we found, Michael, was profoundly disturbing. I went back to the CEO and I said, I will take responsibility for not warning him of all the landmines he stepped in over the last nine months. You take responsibility for putting them there. It, it was astounding to me. And, that's, and, and as we began to do the, the research then, we realized, oh my gosh, these landmines are everywhere. And everybody is you know, predisposed to stepping in them as you, as you, as you ascend and nobody's talking about them. Like we've just made them normal. Right. And of course, 
the 50 to 60 percent failure rate is great for the recruiters because it's an annuity for them. But I, I was so appalled at how cavalier we had been with career, people's careers. These are people's lives. You know, families are moving across countries and worlds. People are uprooting, taking huge risks. I mean, all kinds of things are happening. Organizations are forfeiting opportunity costs at, you know, at nauseum. And this is okay? Like, how is this okay? So that's where I, you know, I think it's those moments that realize, wow, we're not doing a good job of this at all. Like, we really don't have a clue what it means to get somebody ready for the top altitude of a company. And um, so for us, Rising to Power absolutely was a mission. It was a, I literally had pictures of executives all over my office as I wrote that book to remember we're talking to them, not about them. And Eric and, Eric and I were committed to saying, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to give people a roadmap to say, we're, we're going to turn over every single rock covering every, every landmine you could possibly step in and give you a blueprint for what success looks like so you don't have to blow up your career and your organization doesn't have to forfeit what they need you to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, rising to power is indeed this roadmap. And it's really refreshing to hear you say, hey, you guys bore part of the responsibility of that and kind of taking your anger at that happening and going back and that leading to the production of the book. And, and let's talk about that that research, we obviously won't get into all of it. It was a tremendous study. I like what you said, I, I, kind of finding a Rembrandt in the attic, all of this data <laughs> that you had collected over time, analyzing those conversations, parsing them, very analytical. And you came away with these four areas to, to, to boil it down, breadth, context, choice, and connection that differentiated the, the highly successful. Can you just share a couple headlines there on yeah. those four areas? Well, and one of the things I, I know you, you put in your notes was the, the key to these findings was you have to the 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 we kept um, sorting the the successors from the people who fell short, and they did all four. But I didn't want to have to say that, so we we actually did ninety nine different regression analyses on the data to see if we could come up with a way to say it didn't have to be all four. But finally, my team said, Ron, enough. Stop. It, this is what the data says. They, they can change the order if you cut it up on a different kind of sample or a different tenure or whatever, but it's not going to change. These are the things that made them successful. You have to tell people that. So that was hard for me. But, but the, the one thing I think that was, as we sort of then reverse engineered those successful leaders and watched them in action, realized those were things they learned. It wasn't some magical genetic code that they possessed that gave them these four traits. It was that they learned them. Breadth means you understand how their organizational parts fit together, right? So you, you can cross the seams. Because as you get higher in an organization, your goal is not to see marketing or R&D or customer analytics. Your job is to see innovation, right? You have to look, at, look in terms of capabilities, not functional silos. And you have to be able to bridge those seams together and meld them. Context is you have to read the tea leaves. Right? You have to be curious enough to go, go why, why are these things here? Why is this the way it is? Why is our competitor doing that? It's a curiosity thing that you can, uh, and then you don't sort of slap your ideas on things. You, 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 melt, you morph them, you blend them, you adapt them. And so context is the ability to be curious and to adapt to what's in front of you and to read the tea leaves well. Choice is how do you construct your choices? Do, can people reverse engineer and decode how you make your choices, what data you, you want, what intuition you use, whose voices you include, whose voices you don't include, and how do you construct even hard choices and how do you communicate them, including saying no. And that's really what these leaders did well. They were able to say no to even great ideas so that better ideas could prevail, especially the ones they said yes to last week that they've already forgotten about. And now they're ready to go on to the next thing. And then last week is connection. This is, this is the, the, the level of relationship you build with your people above you, your peers, and people below you. It's a, it's a 360 look at how you ingratiate yourself, how you build connections. And the, the key thing about these leaders was that they, they prioritized their relationship network, not by who they needed something from, but by, uh, by who they could help. Who were the people they, whose success they could contribute to was more of a focus of their time than uh, what do I need from you? So uh, four really hard capabilities, um, all learnable. The time to learn them is not when you've been given your first vice presidency. Mm -hmm. Right. 
which is when most people begin to realize that they don't know them. Mm. And, and, and of those four, because you have worked with so many leaders in this transition phase, is there one that's typically more overlooked or hardest or is really dependent? Context really matters for context, okay. right? So for example, if you suck at choice, but you're in an environment whose governance structure is absolutely a mess, you're probably not going to get picked up on it very quickly. What we, ha- what we did notice was that uh, connection and context are quicker fails. So in that 18-month window, those are the two you're going to fail fastest on, whereas breadth and choice are, are take time to show up uh, as failures. So those are later failures in, the, in, in your cycle. So I think it, what really matters, Michael, is what did you show up with? Most people have some degree of capacity for some of those, right? I mean, you, it would be wildly, well, terrifying to know that someone reached a, a senior level role and had none of those, because that means they really need to read your book. <laughs> You've been listening to 97% Effective with your host, executive coach, Michael Winderoff. If this interview is making you think, make sure to share it with a friend. Now, back to our interview. So with that exceptional data and, and these pieces that you pointed out, it also the, the, the piece that came to me, I, about 60% of my practice are, are women or minorities who are you know, not traditionally represented in the, in the top groups. It, I imagine you could have done or could still do some segmentation. Was, was there anything you noticed, differences between subgroups? We, we didn't do that. We didn't, I, I would be remiss to try and cut the data up like that having not done it. I suspect we would have found just one, underrepresentation. Two, a lot of folks asked us about the gender thing. So we went back and did reverse engineer the data against existing research for women in leadership to sort of see how... How do those square up? And in that study, we found that in, in, indeed women are empirically better at these four things than men, just in, in, innately. And so we did publish publish that research late, much later. I don't think anybody was surprised to find that, but we did find that you know if you look at the empirical studies of women in leadership and what makes them successful, despite underrepresentation in the boardroom and the C suite, that in fact the things that it takes to make executives successful in our study are things that they are much better at than men. I think it'd be heartbreaking if you if we screen for, you know, BIPOC people. We already know this from other research, right? The screens that organizations put on them, they're held to a much higher bar than white men. And it's unfortunate because part of the challenge, and I, I, with all due respect to our DEI friends, the DEI community is trying to campaign their way to equity rather than actually create equitable environments. And it's this sort of this bolt-on conversation rather than appreciating, you know, why it's important. It's not just representation. It really is what the substance of the, the differences that, in, the, in that thinking and what it means to lead different kinds of people, which, you know, white men are not predisposed because they don't have to be to think about. <laughs> and, and so many of the DEI communities are, are checking off the representation box without any, any diversity. One executive team I work with about a year and a half ago, a company that absolutely prided itself on its diversity and inclusion efforts. And this executive team was the clip art. Like it was one of everybody. You know, there was LGBTQ, there was Asian, there was Hispanic, there was black, it was gender differences. I mean, it was, it was the, the perfect clip art. And I was, in these, I was there to sort of observe and then, you know, do some work with them as a team on the second day. And at the end of the first day, I said, I'm so sorry to tell you, but there is an, an ounce of diversity in this room, which, of course, made them very defensive. I said, let me tell you, let me go, go back through, through my notes today and tell you at all the points of time where differences emerged, you kicked them out of the room. Let's take this offline. We don't have enough data to discuss that right now. I don't think that's really appropriate for this conversation. I, I had a litany of places where any time there was difference to be explored, they expunged it. And so I said, your goal here was not diversity. Your goal here was homogeneity. So you hide behind the beautiful photograph that you are, but you are not valuing of difference in this room. And of course that you know, pissed them off, and, but I think they recognized that there was some truth to it. And so, because the big D, I mean, sure the recruiters are complaining about, it's hard to find the candidates, you know, we'll look harder. But the small D is the actual harder 
diverse to get. And it's really, really hard work. I mean, you discussed this in your book. It's really hard work. And I don't think people want to work that hard because, because similitude is so comfortable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know some of that extra follow-up research you did. So it's, it was really interesting to hear you share that. This part, a lot of the things that you bring up here and that we both talk about is very hard. You have to apply yourself. But it is something that, that message you said at the front that can be learned, can be built, but it takes a lot of work. And so I would love to kind of go through some of that research, but some very specific questions that, that crop up all the time. And I think your book you know, looks at these and you've got additional perspectives on them. I mean, to start, when you go up, your relationships change. And the classic one is that probably some of your peers now may be your reports. And I think this is a very hard part for, for many of, of the clients I have to deal with or to manage. And you highlight this idea of doing boundary work. Could you just share a point or two about that? Because I think it's very useful here. You know, Michael, I'm guessing you've had many of those clients that you've worked with say things to you like, I'm still me. And you have to deliver the painful message of, well, actually, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, you, I know you just want to be you. And, that, and bless you for wanting to be authentic and genuine. And you should be. But you're on the jumbotron now. There is a megaphone strapped to your mouth 24-7. And those people who you were buddy-buddy with and you go to, go to drinks with and happy hour with and you know maybe golf with on the weekend, that's a different boundary with them now. And they're going to want to curry favor with you. They're going to think, oh, now we got one of us up there. We, here's our shot. And don't think they're not going to want that from you. And you, things you used to talk about, you won't be able to talk about anymore. Things that they're going to want from you, you're going to have to say no. You're going to have to tell them. All the things that you privately thought about their poor performance or their lack of skills or the places where they were falling short, you now actually have to tell them about that. And so you have to recontract. You have to actually start anew with... You know, bosses who are now peers, direct reports who were peers, um, peers who don't know you very well, and say, look, we're both bringing biases into this conversation. We all both have predisposed notions of who we, we each are. How are we going to change that? This relationship is still very important to me, but it's going to have to be, be enacted in a different way. How, how are we going to negotiate those boundaries? And be very clear on, hey, we can't talk about this anymore. Or... Sometimes I won't be able to go to happy hour with you guys anymore. And it's, it's hard. And you're going to sit there at your desk and you're going to watch the team leaving the building, you know, figuring out what club they're going to meet at or what restaurant they're going to meet at for happy hour. And you're going to be sitting there in, with your full inbox thinking, is this really what I signed up for? Yeah. And it's, that's part of a job. It's part of the job. And I like what you said there around the recontracting, then the ability to carry it through. Right. And follow through on it, which is the really hard part. Because a week later, after you have that contracting conversation, someone's going to come and say, hey, Michael, I know this is a little, 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 off the record here. You know, mm. what's going on with Gina? Like she's, I mean, you know, and then it's going to, and, and you're going to, they're going to want to collude. Yeah. Or, you know, hey, I, I heard this. You know, is, is it true? And you're just going to have to re, and it feels so good to be on that inner place and to have the juicy information and. You just, that's, that's all about learning to steward the power that comes with your role. Yeah. And the, the, probably some of the, the more difficult parts when you're kind of on the inside, if you're brought in from the outside, you clearly don't have those relationships. Right. But then the flip side of this is you now start to play, you know, you've gone from the, the A League into to the Champions League and you're dealing with new people at the, at the very, you're working more as peers with some of those people at the very top. And, you know, you, you mentioned this, piece that very important to kind of very early on diagnose the, the power structure, the alliances and the dynamics. And is there an effective strategy that you might share here to get people to, to be thinking about this? Well, that's where I would definitely tell people to read your book. You know, like don't even, that's your, 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 your book is like a walking x-ray machine to look at, you know, who, who has influence, who has, who gets budgets, who, who, who is the CEO listening to in quarterly business reviews, who's getting ignored. Who, who's a jerk, you know, and trying to sort of do the locker room hazing thing. The problem with your diagnosis is that you cannot conform. You cannot use them. Those should not be cues for you to adapt your behavior. They should be cues for you to figure out how to navigate that war world. But the minute you start glomming on to certain actions you think are the, are the currencies of the room, 
you're not reading the room anymore. You've got to read the room and then say, okay, what's the, what's the version of me I want to show up here as? And people, you know, I'm so, uh, you and I had this debate about, you know, what does it mean to be too authentic, right? And I, I, you know, showing up in a room and saying something stupid or saying something inappropriate or breaching boundaries or be, being, you know, overly sharing isn't a function of excessive authenticity. It's just a function of stupidity. Um, and you didn't, you don't know how to read the room. So, you know, you, you have to be, able to, and, and then not only do you have to read the room, but, but validate your interpretations, right? If you're, if you're already predisposed to feeling insecure about how others see you, just know it gets amplified at the top. Any pathologies you bring up, you know, if you're already predisposed to question people's motives, you know, if you're already predisposed to assume people don't like you, if you're already predisposed to assume everybody loves you, if you're already predisposed to feel anxious about certain types of people, gender differences, personal style differences, you know, the, the seventh grade gym teacher that you keep transferring into the room, all of that gets intensified at higher levels. And suddenly you're going to be being triggered everywhere. By the, and if you're not aware of what you're managing, you're going to really misread the room and really not take the cues well and bring in some really unproductive behavior. You know, we talk about reading the room and being situationally appropriate, savvy, to kind of what you said at the very beginning. At what point does that start to cross the line? I think this is where people really have the, the tough time, where you've like become something you totally don't want to be. You become very fake. And, and this is, you know, there's yep. probably that Goldilocks thing where you're somewhere in the middle, but this is very tricky. And, you know, we haven't even started talking about, to be honest, your latest book, you know, to be honest. But if you're saying stuff that needs to be said, at what point does that become kind of fake and then feeding a, a very negative system? It's a great question, Michael. And a lot of people don't know they've crossed that line till long after they've crossed it. Yeah. Hey, here's the litmus test I use. Yeah. You know, so many on, on the other extreme are the leaders who won't, won't adapt at all because, you know, that's not me. Well, that's foolish. You know, I mean, as you so well say in your book, you, you, you're not one thing. None of us are one thing. And so you have to know your audience. You have to read your audience. You have to adapt your style, your influence, you know, think, to, to, the, to the room. That's not being inauthentic. That's being considerate, right? Now, at, when that adaptation becomes disingenuous, in other words, you're saying things, acting in ways, currying, sucking up, doing things that belie what you value, things you would tell someone else not to do. And you've told yourself, well, I have no choice because... Or you, f- you know that your gut says, this feels icky, but it's what, it's what you have to do. You have to play the game. You know, when you start telling yourself things like that, you've probably gone over that line. Because if you're compromising your values, hiding significant parts of who you are, manipulating information to engineer a certain response from people to you, it's, first of all, it's unsustainable. You'll be exhausted. And second of all, at some point, you'll cross wires, right? You'll become, you'll be, you'll completely contradict yourself from one person to another and they'll compare notes, right? So what you want to make sure is no matter what room you're in, no matter how you're adapting, if any of the people from any of those rooms were to talk about you and compare notes, they wouldn't feel like they were all talking about a different person. So there's some consistency there. And I mean, does it help that, that litmus test? I find it helps people to write down a couple of those things of, of when they know they've crossed the lines. Because if you don't always. write it down, you're always shifting. It's, it's, in fact, I, th- I love that about your advice about journaling and writing it down. I actually think people should do it beforehand. Yeah. And afterwards and have a before-after comparison. Yeah. This, this point around continual learning, but also a check on yourself. Right. And it's a great check on yourself because you're going to see it in black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if the, what you did afterwards deviates a lot from what you say you were going to do beforehand, you have to ask yourself why that is. Yeah, yeah. And I think this goes to a larger point too. If you if you have a great environment around you, other people can also keep you in check, but they're also not going to do that if you kind of kill them every time they bring That's a right. message to you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and so this is. I mean, the research again, and and your book goes much more in depth on all these topics. I I, I would ask this one with all the pressures. The 24-7, the deliver results yesterday, <laughs> you know, this, the first 90 days, you know, hit the ground running. You use this phrase of, it shouldn't be hit the ground running, hit the ground learning. My question to you is, 
how do execs kind of buy that time when there's so much pressure to like deliver right away? You know, is that managing your, the people who keep you there? <laughs> it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly a big part of it, Michael. I think we, when leaders falsely impose on themselves a lack of reality, so pressure is different than pressure that makes you depart from reality, right? Because things are in bad shape doesn't mean you can suddenly, you know, take a, a 12 or 24 month journey and turn it into a three month journey. You, you can't alter reality. This is not the matrix. And when you tell yourself you can, you, you become irrational and almost pathological in your decision making. And so, you know, how leaders internalize the pressure uh, is really important and how they take care of themselves and their own health, mental and physical health is critical so that they don't lose sight of what's realistic. Bad news is bad news. If you don't like delivering bad news, you shouldn't be in the job. And especially if some of the bad news preceded you. So you, you have to take us, keeping your eye on the long view, especially in the face of severe headwinds, is so critical. And many leaders can't do it because they just want the headwinds to stop. And, you know, we have how many hundreds of years of history of business cycles, right? Whatever headwinds you're facing, even the pandemic, frankly, I mean, it's been 100 years, but it, it's, not, it's hardly a precedent. And so, you know, for when, when it really is, this is unprecedented, you know, that's one playbook. But for the most part, there are a lot of transferable playbooks across crises, across headwinds, across economic cycles, across geopolitical cycles, across inflation cycles, right? And you have to step back and ask yourself, what's the long view here? What's the long game here? Because if you get sucked into believing that you can alter reality with some self-appointed hero syndrome, and I'm going to buck the trend, or I'm going to, you know, prove myself, or whatever, or I'm going to, you know, I want to, I want to buy affirmation or favor by making my boss look good. You are really heading off a cliff. Uh, you know, there's, there's just not rabbits to be pulled out of hats in those moments the way you would want there to be. Sure, you want there to be, but there's just not. Yeah. Have the long view and also this part around, I guess, you know, you got to have a, a thicker skin. But what's like the school that you go to to like develop that? First of all, it's just recognizing, okay, I don't have thick skin. It's just being honest about that. But then we have to ask the question, who thinned your skin? Right? Because thin skin is a learned behavior. Right? The lack of resilience, the emotional resilience, the lack of a capacity to absorb the darts. I'm actually working on a, a piece right now for HBR on how, how do leaders take public criticism. You know, I mean, we're watching Elon right now, you know, earn the scorn of the world. <laughs> so what do you do when, the, when you're the dartboard? What do you do? And nobody's skin is impenetrable. But if, you're, if, you're, if you just have a need to be liked, if you just have a need to not have fingers pointing at you or to feel ostracized or estranged from people who you've disappointed, any of that, you probably shouldn't be leading. But you can go and get help. You can go to a coach, a, thera a, a trained coach, a therapist, somebody to understand why is my skin so thin? Why? Because it's not random. There's not some people born with a predisposition to be a you know, have armor coated skin while some people are just overly sensitive and just can't take the heat. Where, where, wherever you are on that continuum, you learned it and you can relearn something else, but you have to go do the work. Mm. Yeah. So looking at yourself and learning. And, there, and then, and there are some environments I'm, I'm sure you would agree that if it really is just a toxic dart throwing, you know, snake pit, you, you, you the real question is, do you want to, is that the environment you want to be in? Do you, I mean, can you even succeed in that environment if anybody could? Exactly. And what will that cost you to succeed in that environment? Do you, is it really worth it? Yeah. Ron, this has been fascinating. I would love to talk to you more in depth about the topics. Has there been a, a question here or a topic that I have not asked that you'd like to address? Oh, my gosh, Michael. You've been so thorough. I, I'm so grateful for that. You know, I think that if I was sort of find the red thread throughout our whole conversation, and I think this is where another place where both of our work intersects, it's preparation. You know, you can be ready for the, all of this, 
but you just have to, nobody shows up at the Olympics, you know, having not trained. Why would you show up at an executive role not prepared and not having done your reps? Wherever you're at in your career, you can start now, right? Even if that, especially if that role is three to five years away, you know, the luxury you now have of really preparing yourself and stealing yourself. Don't waste it. Don't squander it. We need to turn your book into a simulation that we put people through. I mean, airline pilots do it all the time. They've got to go through every six months. They're learning those skills. Just a thought that, that, that was generated as you talked. We've actually, we've actually done it. Yeah. Wow. We actually have built those simulations for companies. Wow. And are they effective? Is it helpful? It's very powerful because, it's, because we watch you for like three days run the, comp- run the future of the company. And we engineer new behavior. So we, we're watching everything you do. We give you feedback you know, along the way. And Tremendous. the simulation sort of can last 12 to 18 months of time in three days. So we'll do some work, watch you do it. Fast forward six months, put you back in the simulation. Fast forward a year and watch you, you know, deal with the challenges of what the, the future of that role and the, that work will require. It's very powerful. We call it, and we call it rehearsing the future. Mm. Rehearsing the future. Rehearsing the future. Ron, obviously your book, Navalent, but what is the best way for people to follow and see more of your work? Certainly follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Well, as long as we still have Twitter. Uh, <laughs> and certainly at navalent.com, N A V A L E N T.com, you'll find lots of downloadable ebooks, assessments, videos, online courses. There's an online course to go with Rising to Power. You can go take, uh, you can find that at yeah, navalent.com. And yeah, please do stay in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. What a pleasure. Right back at you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for listening to 97% Effective, where we skip happy talk and help you break through and ascend one hard truth at a time. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, you can get free resources, including the first chapters of Michael's book, Get promoted on his website, www.changwinderoth.com. That's www.changwinderoth.com.